So welcome to EACT TV uh, 2012 in Barcelona. My name is Jörg Seebog. I'm a cardiac surgeon from the Heart Center of Leipzig, and I have the pleasure of uh, leading this discussion on the topic of lateral thinking, a new session that has been initiated this year at EACT. Before we get started, I would like to intru introduce every one of you. I would like to ask you to introduce yourself. Please go ahead. My name is Jose Pomar. I am a cardiovascular surgeon here in Barcelona and uh, the incoming president of the EACTS. Thank you. No. Well, thank you for coming. My pleasure. My name is Frank Litvak, and I'm an interventional cardiologist and medical device developer from Los Angeles, California. Thanks. I'm Mike Mack, and I'm a cardiac surgeon from Dallas, Texas, in the U.S., in the Baylor Healthcare System. I'm Ruben Osnabrugge. I'm a PhD fellow in Rotterdam, and besides medicine, I also studied health economics. Well, thanks for the introduction. I would like to just get started on the topic. Uh, it's a rather strange topic or a new topic to a scientific meeting. It's called lateral thinking. And there was one idea behind this whole uh, <coughs> meeting or behind this whole session, and there is one statement I would just like to cite, and uh, this is actually the base of the whole discussion. It says that we, as cardiothoracic surgeons, do not have the impact that we could have because we don't really focus on the most important problems. That is the statement, and I would like to ask uh, each one of you if you agree, or what would your, what your answer be? I fully agree. I think a surgeon needs to have a good hands and better brain. And uh, it doesn't make too much sense when we have a meeting where we can discuss all together, not to talk only about the mitral valve or the aortic valve, also to talk about uh, any other issues, many other which are of interest for the, the, the whole uh, community of surgeons. And I think this is, a, for me, a very pertinent session. Mm. I think, uh, thank you very much for organizing it. Well, very good. It's, it's my pleasure. But would you agree that we have to go beyond just plain cardiac surgery? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, we have to do and, and I think we, we have to try to have more, meet, more sessions like this one in the next uh, coming meetings. Uh, I think uh, the, the young people need to uh, also understand that uh, being a very quick surgeon doesn't mean more than 10, 15 percent. Mm. You have to do it, but you have to think how to do it and you have to innovate and I'm sure they are going to talk about that because they are mm -hmm. pioneers in this, in this field. So mm. I, I fully agree. So you are an interventional cardiologist. How would you um, respond to this statement? Uh, I, I would say that, that it's correct, but it's changing. So years back, um, the surgeons sat in the alpha or dominant position in cardiovascular medicine, and the cardiologists were feeding them patients. Uh, the cardiologist adapted and became very rapidly innovative. And in the early years of intervention and interventional innovation, there was a great deal of conflict. I myself was physically threatened by cardiac surgeons many times. Uh, How? Can you <laughs> explain? That, that is, well, in the early days of angioplasty, um, I remember <laughs> being threatened by uh, cardiac surgeons when I was very young. Um, but now you see that um, uh, there's been a big change, I think, in cardiac surgery and it's led by some of the people, I think, at this table, where innovation is being embraced and um, collegiality with interventional cardiologists is occurring. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be fantastic for the field because surgeons bring a completely different perspective to cardiac disease than cardiologists do. They have a different understanding of the anatomy uh, and a different understanding of the structure of the heart. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what I'd like to see is um, that we lose the 19th century paradigm of cardiologist, yeah. cardiac surgeon, and that it, a, med a, a specialty becomes established of cardiovascular medicine where one trains uh, across the gamut of uh, surgery and intervention. I, I think that 30, 40 years from now, that's probably going to be the way things are. 30, 40 years, are you that pessimistic or? No. Well, well I, I, I'm not pessimistic, and some people are doing it. There's a small number of surgeons who are training in interventional cardiology. But what I think I'd like to see is cardiology 
being taken out of the Department of Medicine, yeah. cardiac surgery being taken out of the Department of Surgery, and training from day one, beginning with intervention and cardiac surgery together. And I think that that's going to take some decades because uh, things don't change rapidly in the politics of medicine, uh, but it's inevitable. Don't you think training would be too, too much or too long to get to reach a high level of excellence in both of these disciplines? If you start training as an interventional cardiologist and also training as a surgeon? I think that um, it can definitely be done because there's a lot of overlap. Um, and uh, perhaps we spend too long in cardiology in general internal medicine, at least in the States, usually we'll do three full years of general internal mm -hmm. medicine. Maybe we can knock a year off that and do a uh, six years training in cardiovascular mm -hmm. medicine. I believe it can be done. Training's going to get longer mm -hmm. because the complexity mm -hmm. of what we do is, uh, is always growing. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that everybody would do everything. Uh, some people would do structural work. Some people would do coronary work. Mm -hmm. Some people would do electrophysiology others congenital, but I do think we will be looking at a merging of the fields. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dr. Mack, how would you respond to this statement? So I also agree with uh, Frank and Jose that uh, it is absolutely true. I think you think, uh, I think of it as coronary bypass surgery in many ways was the best thing that ever happened to cardiac surgery and the worst thing that ever happened to cardiac surgery. We went from, era, from an era of being the jet jockeys of medicine to becoming the Sopwith camels because mm -hmm. we were so busy, we had our heads in the operating room, uh, just working, just focusing on that, and we totally lost our inventiveness. Mm -hmm. um, I've <clears throat> said many times that, um, I, I'm, and I'm an example of that, that I never would have invented a transcatheter aortic valve. Uh, because I knew all the failure modes of it, all the reasons why it can't work. Mm -hmm. And it took, it took a non-surgeon to, in, to invent it because the glass was half full, not half empty. They knew mm -hmm. what to take to make it work and not having always um, an attitude of, well, it can't work because of this. And so I, I'm guilty of that, uh, of that thinking and I think that that has permeated us because we were a specialty that in the 1960s and 1970s were full of creativity and inventiveness and out of the box thinking. So as Frank has alluded to though, I think we're beginning to get back there again. How can we stimulate the discussion and stimulate the progress to be more inventive, to be more creative as a surgeon? Well, I think Frank's given part of that answer <laughs> uh, and it's partnership with cardiologists and, uh, cardiologists and together uh, being cardiac disease specialists uh, rather than surgeons or cardiologists. So there's a synergy that happens from that partnership and from that relationship. And the other thing is things like this, of talking about it, putting these sessions on at meetings, mm -hmm. putting a session on that's going to be seen like this on the internet. Just the fact that you bring it out uh, and, and make it an issue gets people thinking. Okay. You've May I say something? I think we have to start from the very low levels, and uh, Frank was saying about 30, 40 years. Eight years ago, we started in the university, the medical school here, and we have an integrated program. It is true that it's not the same, but at least we have a program of the circulatory, cardiac circulatory diseases. And we have, uh, in the morning, a cardiologist talking about the mitral stenosis, and after that, a surgeon explaining how to uh, do an operation on a mitral stenosis or a mitral repair and mitral incompetence. Mm -hmm. So we do not need to repeat again surgeons, uh, the same thing they said two months before the, the, uh, the cardiologist or the internal medical doctors. And the same thing we do in normal life in the hospital, we already have, and as in many already in Europe and the States, institutes where we have a head of an institute, but we have uh, cardiologists, we have uh, surgeons, we have uh, pneumologists, and thoracic surgeons, and all together, and we have to share the everything from the uh, the money until uh, mm -hmm. the way we educate the people, uh, the training of the people. So we are, I think, we are slowly pushing or trying to to explain the people that we need to work together, and we try our best to get even the patients in the same area with yeah. the same kind of resources. 
So you, you're referring also to the multidisciplinary heart team that is recommended and that is more it's, it's or less it's mandatory. Coming along. It's coming along because uh, you, you have meetings every day with the cardiologist, the interventional cardiologist and the echocardiographist and uh, I mean we don't need to do any special thing because we used to do it. Uh, I have here uh, the echocardiographist that now talking at three mm -hmm. uh, about the mitral and it's, I think it's coming along. Slowly everybody gets educated in this field and I am sure he said that he's right. The problem is the political people. But the political people, they are too busy, and we have to do an effort to give them everything already done, and then probably will, they will accept it as it is already organized. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have to do an effort as, as a specialist in this area, cardiology and surgeon, surgeons, to show them a good training program integrated. And I think the politicians will be very happy. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. 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 <laughs> Ruben, can I ask you if you agree to this initial statement that we don't have the impact we could have? Yes, I totally agree with that. And um, just to um, uh, elongate on the uh, political side, I think we should also look at um, uh, other areas than on, uh, only medicine. So integrate uh, health economics. I, can, sure. I think we can use that as a tool to assess what interventions are um, yeah, having the most impact on, on uh, economic problems. and. In this world of economic crisis, I think it's important to set, uh, yeah, uh, prioritize which uh, things we want to do first. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, so. So, so that maybe brings us to the next uh, thing that is obvious. Uh, you mentioned economics, and we are at the EX meeting, which is supposed to be a scientific meeting. But if you're very um, honest, it's not just a scientific meeting. It's also an industry-sponsored meeting, and I have concerns in. In for the future, that if meetings like this are that much of uh, industry sponsored, will these meetings become industry meetings and not just plain scientific meetings? Is there any way that we could regulate? Is there are there any new models that we could use uh, for financing these these uh, meetings? Because the science behind this meeting that's the actually most important thing. But I have the impression that it doesn't get the the podium that it really deserves. What would be your impression of this? Well, I, I think it's a very interesting uh, question. It's one that's been debated over the last 10 to 15 years very seriously. Um, clearly, our specialties could not survive without industry. All the innovation that we apply every day in our practices and that we hope to apply is funded by industry. And if we attempt to separate industry from practitioners, it's like separating golf club manufacturers from professional golfers. They won't have good golf clubs and it won't be an interesting sport. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to foster that collaboration, but we also need to have assurances that industry does not control the agenda of the meetings, that there is absolute and complete disclosure um, of financial support at every level so that the intelligent member of the audience can accept, filter, and process the data in context. I believe that the physicians who attend these meetings to hear presentations and to learn are very intelligent people. These are not silly people. They understand um, the impact uh, that industry can have on how data is presented. And I think we just need to control that, monitor it, and disclose it and we can have a very, very healthy relationship with industry. How do you, as the next president, deal with the conflict of interest of being a businessman and also a doctor, a cardiac surgeon? Uh, I think that the question was very pertinent. In fact, uh, a couple of days ago, we had a, uh, a meeting, Americans, European, and Asian people uh, with the industry, trying to see how to reorganize this issue. And one of the CEOs, I don't know if you were there, one of the CEOs was saying, well, you know, this is a too long meeting. You have to concentrate in two days. Today was fantastic, the Techno College, which is fantastic, really. But at the end, as you said, it's a little bit of a show, showing something which scientifically is not yet proven, and it's very appealing to all of us. Uh, and the problem is that this is called uh, scientific society. So you need to have 
at least two days to have the people presenting their own research and the, because this is how we advance really. Mm -hmm. So there is a big conflict in this sense and uh, I, I don't have a real uh, and clear uh, solution to that but we have to get into it because uh, industry is not going to be because of the normal laws everywhere not going to be able to support the doctors directly and they, they will have to do it or through the societies and the society get grants for the people but for sure it will not be possible to have 4,500 people like we have here mm -hmm. so I think the model has to change in two or three years otherwise in three or four years times this will not work anymore be decreasing uh, yeah. yes um, Dr. Mack you have a topic uh, in this session which is called um, a randomized trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine is that the holy grail of marketing that also refers to the conflict of interest um, how would you answer that question so it, it clearly is the holy grail uh, to get a randomized trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, is very high profile um, and is kind of the, the be-all and the end-all of scientific research in our field. And it's all about the impact factor, which mm -hmm. is the number of times that an article is cited uh, in the uh, sub uh, the number of times articles in a journal has been cited in the previous two years. And as an example, the New England Journal, uh, the impact factor is 54. Uh, our cardiothoracic surgery journals, the impact factor is two and a half or three. Yeah. So it's 18 times more likely to be cited and therefore presumably read and known about if it's in the New England Journal rather than in one of our specialty journals. It reaches a much broader audience and therefore is marketed much better. Yeah. Okay. How would you see that from a business perspective, um, publishing or using scientific journals as a vehicle for marketing? Uh, well, I think it's it's inevitable because the clinical trials have to be sponsored. Uh, it's, they, are, they are very expensive. But on the other end, we have to make sure that um, the data um, is scrutinized very well and that um, everything is made clear in the in the article itself, so that the professional can judge for itself, um, yeah, what the okay. conclusions are. And uh, so we're running out of time, but I would like to ask one uh, final question. Where do you see this meeting in 10 years? How do you see it? Will it be internet-based meeting? Will it be just a networking meeting? Will it be plain scientific meeting? What would be your uh, vision? I, I, I hope it's going to be something similar. I think human beings, we have to be able to see each other and discuss together. Uh, I think uh, technology is great, but uh, it's not the same. We are talking here together or we do it on a teleconference, it's, it's a completely different thing. So I hope, even if it's going to change the format, at least once a year we will be able to sit down together and talk and discuss the things face to face. And I think this, I did it, but again, the problem is uh, the money. Uh, it would be to do that with interventional cardiologists together, but uh, as you say, we cannot have a meeting of 10 days because mm -hmm. all the scientific societies need the money of the meetings to survive during the year. And you cannot tell the cardiologist or the surgeon to stop doing this kind of meeting. I don't know what do you think. No, I absolutely agree with you. It would be a real tragedy if we lost the ability for face-to-face -face interaction. Um, ever since the beginning of modern medicine and modern science, uh, the ability for investigators from different countries, different places, to get together and um, talk and meet and go out to dinner um, has fostered uh, cross-pollinization and fertilization of progress. And if we can't do that anymore, unquestionably the field will be hurt and I think patient care will, will ultimately be hurt as well, which is mm -hmm. what we're all about in the end of the day. Dr. Mack, where do you see this? Ten years of time. I, I see it more the same than different. Um, I, I, eight or ten years ago, I thought with the advances in telecommunications and inter, 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 easy for me to say, instant uh, uh, ability to communicate uh, across countries, cities, uh, that the need for meetings like this would go away. You'd, we would be able to travel less. But 
um, you lose the dynamic of personal interaction when that's not, when that doesn't happen. And so much of the real advancement happened in the hallways outside of meetings, mm -hmm. you know, rather than in the session rooms. It, it's having the ability to talk or discuss um, um, a, a paper that you just heard or new ideas that you've had or meet the correct people that so much of the, of the advances happen outside the rooms and I think when you don't have the personal interaction face to face person to person that a lot of that connectivity and synergy gets lost would get lost so uh, I think it's going to be uh, of course the formats have to change and evolve but I don't see the meetings changing okay I only yes want to say one final word as the next president to operate a patient without not seeing him never before you just got an email, you just get an X-ray or a coronary angiogram, and you go to the OR, you open, you close, you, as a surgeon, would you be happy to do that? No. Well, I think this is more or less going to be the same. Well, that's a good final word. I thank you all for coming. I appreciate your uh, open-minded uh, thoughts or your open discussion and your strong messages. Thank you. Thank you.